The Old West was not all shootouts and gunslingers engaged in quick-draw duels on Main Street, indeed shootouts were often deadlier for bystanders than the participants, and gunslingers preferred to shoot their victims in the back when possible, it was safer for the shooter, still, the American West, could get rough. And plenty of notorious outlaws gave often only slightly less notorious lawmen all the work they could handle to impose law and order, following are 20 things about some of the more fascinating lawmen and outlaws of the Old West. Number 20. The lawman whose career marked the transition from the Old West to the modern era. When Francis Frank Augustus Hamer began his career in law enforcement in Texas in 1905, lawmen still chased cattle rustlers, bandits, and other outlaws across the West on horseback. Policing was minimal and often ad hoc and sheriffs routinely rounded up posses when extra bodies were needed. By the time he retired in 1949, lawmen were part of an established bureaucracy of law enforcement, went from thither to yon by automobiles, used airplanes and communicated via radios and wireless devices. His career thus witnessed the transformation of law enforcement from that of legendary Old West lawmen to the era of modern policing. Hamer was born in Texas in 1884, and in his youth he was noted for keen intelligence, photographic memory and was a crack shot with a pistol. Raised in a devoutly religious family, he wanted to become a preacher when he grew up, at age 16, while working on a ranch belonging to a Dan McSween. The proprietor offered him $150 to shoot a business associate, he refused and warned the marked man, in retaliation McSween shot Hamer in the back and left side of the head and left him for dead. He was saved by a black field hand and never forgot it until his dying day. A colored man was the best friend I ever had in my life, that colored man caused me to be living today. Number 19. The American West Lawman Who Survived an Ungodly Number of Gunfights In a law enforcement career that lasted for nearly half a century, Frank Hamer survived 52 gunfights, was wounded 23 times in the line of duty, killed between 53 and 70 men and was declared dead not once, nor even twice but four times, to put that in perspective, if we add up all the gunfights that Old West legends Wyatt Earp, Wild Bill Hickok and Billy the Kid took part in, the total comes to a possible maximum of 21 gunfights. Emphasis should be placed on the word possible when it comes to Earp, Hickok and the Kid, because some of those legendary figures' gunfight accounts rest on shaky grounds, but if we accept all known accounts as true, Frank Hamer still went through more than twice the combined number of gunfights, that three of the Old West's most famous character had participated in, and his tally of up to 70 killed men made him deadlier than just about any Wild West gunfighter. Number 18. A Natural Born Man Hunter Frank Hamer performed his first notable crime-busting feat while still a private citizen. In 1905, he was employed at a ranch when two horses were stolen, he picked up the trail, and followed it for several days on his own until he closed in on the culprits. Using natural terrain features as cover, he made his way through a gully until he got in front of them, then waited until they showed up and took them by surprise with a leveled Winchester, he took the thieves prisoner, delivered them to the local sheriff, and returned the stolen horses to his employer. The thrill of his first manhunt was a rush that Hamer wanted more of, and a few months later, he once again set out on his own, and tracked down and captured another horse thief. The sheriff was impressed, this is the second time you've done my work. He did a mighty fine job of catching this man. Frank, how do you like to be a Texas Ranger? Hamer was interested, and the sheriff arranged to get him accepted into the most famous and controversial law enforcement organization of the American West. From then until his retirement in 1949, Hamer was a Texas Ranger off and on, resigning on various occasions to take other jobs than rejoining the force. Number 17. A law enforcement legend amidst the slaughter. Frank Hamer's first stint with the Texas Rangers lasted for two years, which he spent along the Mexican border. He resigned in 1908 to become city marshal of Navasota, Texas, a boom town. Navasota was racked by out-of-control violence, and shootouts on its main street were so frequent that in a two-year stretch, more than a hundred people were killed. 24-year-old Hamer took over as the town's top cop and within a short time, he had re-established law and order. It was a feat helped in no small part by his willingness to add to the town's body count. After a few shootouts in which he killed some miscreants, Hamer established his reputation as a law enforcement officer that bad guys did not want to mess with. After order was restored in Navasota, he moved on to a few more law enforcement stints, including Houston, before he rejoined the Texas Rangers in 1915. He was sent to patrol the border near Brownsville, and arrived at the height of one of the Rangers' most controversial stretches, 
It was La Matanza, time of intense anti-Mexican violence that lasted from 1910 to 1920. Number 16. The Hour of Blood During La Matanza, the Texas Rangers spearheaded a wave of extrajudicial killings, lynchings, and massacres amidst operations against cross-border raids known as the Bandit Wars. The raids were carried out by rebels from south of the border, amidst the chaos of the Mexican Revolution that was taking place at the time. Coupled with ever-present anti-Mexican racism, the raids triggered a violent backlash that extended to all Mexican Americans in Texas, and especially those living along the border. Those suspected of harboring any sympathy for the rebels were blacklisted by the Texas Rangers, and often disappeared. In a campaign led by the Rangers and joined by vigilantes and local law enforcement, thousands of Mexican Americans were murdered, and thousands more fled across the border into Mexico. The violence peaked between August 1915 to June 1916, a period that came to be named Ora de Sangre, Time of Blood, as a contemporary recalled. All the Rangers had to was get a suspicion on somebody, any little thing, and they would take him out and shoot him down. Hundreds of Mexicans were indiscriminately murdered in South Texas, which triggered a flight to Mexico so severe that ranchers and farmers complained that all their field hands had left. Even Mexican-American landowners fled, some with such urgency that they abandoned thousands of cattle behind. Number 15. This lawman's wife was as deadly as him. In 1917, Frank Hamer took a break from La Matanza to marry Gladys Johnson Sims, the widow of a prosperous Snyder, Texas, man named Ed Sims, she had attained widowhood in dubious circumstances. In 1916, Gladys and her brother were charged with the murder of her husband. On October 1, 1917, Hamer, Gladys, and some relatives were at a gas station when they came across the deceased Ed Sims' brother-in-law Gus McMeans, former Texas Ranger and Sheriff of Hector County. A shootout erupted between Hamer's party and that of McMeans, and as Hamer and McMeans were clinched in a grapple, the latter was shot in the heart and killed. Hamer was wounded, but he survived and made a full recovery. When the gun smoke cleared and the cops arrived, they collected two semi-automatic pistols, three rifles and seven revolvers from the parties. Soon after he recovered, Hamer became a federal prohibition agent and took part in numerous raids and shootouts against bootleggers. Number 14. An American West law enforcement legend takes on the Ku Klux Klan. Frank Hamer was not a progressive on the issue of race by any means, and harbored his share of the year's widespread racism however, he had a sense of fairness and justice, and a respect for law and order that rendered lynchings, and mob violence against blacks repugnant in his eyes. After a year as a federal prohibition agent, he rejoined the Texas Rangers, and was assigned to Austin as a senior ranger captain, in 1922. He led the fight in the Lone Star Republic against the Ku Klux Klan, KKK for short, which was experiencing a boom at the time. Throughout his career, Hamer saved at least 15 people from lynch mobs led by the KKK, often by threatening to shoot the baying riders. By then, his reputation as a deadly lawman you don't want to mess with had been solidly established not just in Texas, but throughout the entire West. His only failure occurred in 1930, when Hamer and a handful of rangers were tasked with protecting a black rape suspect in Sherman, Texas, a huge mob stormed the courthouse and although Hamer shot two of them, they set the building on fire and forced the rangers to retreat. Number 13. Frank Hamer's Most Famous Exploit Frank Hamer was already a law enforcement legend when the authorities turned to him in 1934 to hunt down and end the depredations of Bonnie and Clyde. In the early 1930s, Bonnie Elizabeth Parker and her boyfriend Clyde Chestnut Barrow had kicked off a violent crime spree that generated intense media coverage and embarrassed law enforcement across numerous states. Hamer, who had retired in 1932, was talked into going after the Barrow gang and was given a special commission and a free hand. He studied the gang's pattern of movements and realized that they usually operated in a wide circle through the lower Midwest with anchor points in Dallas, Joplin, Missouri and northern Louisiana. Hamer formed a posse that drew personnel from various jurisdictions and tracked the gang for months. Finally, after 102 days, he got a solid tip that Bonnie and Clyde would drive on a rural road near Gibsland, Louisiana and set up an ambush. On the morning of May 23, 1934, Clyde stopped his car at the ambush site, and he and Bonnie were almost immediately riddled with a fusillade of more than 150 bullets that further cemented Hamer's status as the greatest lawman of the American West. Afterwards, he worked as the head of private security for various oil and shipping companies, then rejoined the Texas Rangers in 1948. He retired for a final time in 1949, 
suffered a heat stroke in 1953, and lingered in poor health until he died in Austin in 1955. Number 12. The Old West was a magnet for the restless, the troubled, and the violent. Frank Hamer began his career in the dying days of classical Old West lawmen. Earlier, throughout the 19th century, the United States had relentlessly pushed its frontier westward in pursuit of what came to be termed the Young Republic's manifest destiny. Settlers steadily populated vast swathes with a relentless stream of new arrivals, who upped stakes and abandoned their homes out east or across the oceans, in pursuit of dreams of greener pastures and a fresh start in the American West. Unsettled frontiers tend to attract a disproportionate number of single young men, eager for adventure and new horizons, rowdy, rambunctious and restless, in the absence of the social restraints that are typically imposed by families and neighbors in more established communities. Such men frequently turn lawless, that was what happened in the Old West, where it often took many years between the initial settlement of new communities, and their settling down into the rut and norms of established civil society. In such a fluid and volatile environment, it took decades to establish effective law and order and finally tame the West. Number 11. The often blurry line between lawmen and outlaws. Because of the fluid situation, with a steady stream of newcomers pouring into a region with little established law enforcement, the Old West saw a boom in banditry. Many gave in to the temptation of easy riches in a region that abounded with readily portable wealth, be it cash, gold, cattle or horses, violent criminals, many of whom frequently transitioned from outlaws to lawmen and back again, crossed and recrossed the sometimes blurry line between criminals and crime stoppers multiple times during their lifetimes. Stagecoaches were a primary target for outlaws, because they frequently transported valuables and payrolls in their strong boxes, and required relatively little to rob aside from the robber's audacity. More importantly, they could be halted in isolated locales, and that gave robbers time to flee before law enforcement arrived and attempted to track down the culprits. The arrival of the railroads added another lucrative target, albeit a more labor-intensive one, that required teamwork from a sizable outlaw gang to subdue an entire train in order to rob its hold and passengers, and throughout, banks were a standby target of choice. Number 10. The Old West Outlaw Who Became a Lawman John King Fisher, born 1853 died 1884, started off as an Old West Outlaw, but ended his days as a lawman born and raised in Texas. Fisher had turned bad at an early age. When he was 15 years old, he was sentenced to two years imprisonment for horse theft. But one early release because of his youth, soon thereafter, he joined a group of bandits who raided across the border into Mexico, and began to adopt a flamboyant persona. He dressed in flashy clothes, such as a black Mexican jacket embroidered with gold, a red sash, a wide sombrero, and sported silver-plated and ivory-handled pistols. He styled himself a gunslinger, and proved himself one when a dispute over the division of the loot triggered a shootout in which a teenaged Fisher killed three fellow bandits. After the gun smoke cleared, Fisher took over as gang leader and over subsequent months, he killed seven more bandits to defend his leadership claim. In 1872, he bought a ranch on the Mexican border and used it as a base of operations for cattle rustling raids into Mexico. The Texas Rangers eventually raided the ranch and arrested Fisher, but released him upon his promise to cease raiding. He then tried his hand at legitimate cattle ranching but ranch operations were frequently impeded by his violent temper. Number 9. A Violent Man Who Literally Got Away With Murder In 1878, John King Fisher got into an argument with two Mexican cowboys, and greatly escalated things when he smashed in the head of one with an iron rod, and shot the other dead when he tried to draw his pistol. He then shot two other Mexicans who had been sitting on a fence and simply watching. Since his victims were Mexican and it was the Old West, Nothing came of it, nor did anything come of other instances when Fisher was arrested for violent acts and attempted murders, only to be released when witnesses refused to come forward or disappeared. Although he was a notorious troublemaker, Fisher was nonetheless liked in the community, and by the 1880s he had transitioned from bandit to lawman. He served a brief stint as sheriff of Uvalde County in 1883, during which service he tracked down a pair of stagecoach robbers, shot one dead and brought the other one in. The following year, Fisher went to see a play with a friend in San Antonio, but was killed when a quarrel between his friend and the theater owner ended with Fisher and friend ambushed in their theater box, and cut down in a hail of bullets. Number 8. The Deadliest Outlaw of the Old West It is highly likely that John Wesley Hardin, born 1853-1895, was the deadliest outlaw gunslinger to have strode across the Old West, 
a trigger-happy killer who was eager to pull out a gun and blast away for any good reason, bad reason or no reason at all Hardin's victims numbered in the dozens. He once shot a man for snoring too loud, according to his own claims, which might or might not have been exaggerated. He killed 42 men, contemporary newspapers verified 27 killings that were attributed to Hardin. Whatever the actual number of his victims, this murderer and all-around psychopath came from an unlikely background, the son of a Methodist minister and a member of a prominent Texas family that included a judge and a state legislator, Hardin was a bad person from early on. His violent career began in 1867 when he stabbed a schoolmate. A year later, at age 15, he shot and killed an uncle's former black slave in an argument over a wrestling match. Number 7. John Wesley Hardin's Killing Spree John Wesley Hardin fled to Sumter, Texas, were claimed to have killed three Union soldiers in 1868 when they tried to arrest him, as he put it, I've waylaid them, as I had no mercy on men whom I knew only wanted to get my body to torture and kill, it was war to the knife for me, and I brought it on by opening the fight with a double-barreled shotgun, and entered it with a cap and ball six-shooter, thus it was by the fall of 1868 I had killed four men and was myself wounded in the arm. Within a year of that triple homicide, he killed another soldier, in 1871, the fugitive Hardin decided to try his hand at becoming a cowboy on the Chisholm Trail, he killed seven people en route, including two men in a card game and an Indian just for practice, he killed another three men when he got to Abilene, Kansas. Later that year, he walked up to two black policemen who were looking for him and shot them both, killing one and wounding the other. He was well on his way to becoming the deadliest outlaw of the Old West. Number 6. This Old West outlaw worked hard to hone his lethality. John Wesley Hardin worked hard to perfect his skills as a gunslinger. He carried his pistols and holsters sewn into his vest, with the butts pointed inwards across his chest. He crossed his arms to draw, which he deemed the quickest way to get his pistols into action. And he practiced his draw technique every day. He also kept on steadily piling up the corpses and on his 21st birthday in 1874, he quarreled with a deputy sheriff and shot him dead. That killing of a lawman led to a $4,000 dead or alive reward placed on Hardin, today. That would be the equivalent of over $86,000. He chose discretion over valor and fled Texas with his wife and daughter. He eventually settled in Florida, and under an assumed name, set himself up as a businessman. That peaceful interlude lasted until 1877, when Texas Rangers caught up with Hardin on a train in Pensacola. He tried to draw a revolver, but it got snagged on his suspenders, and the ranger's pistol whipped him into submission. Number 5. From convicted murderer to lawyer In 1878, John Wesley Hardin was tried, convicted and sentenced to 25 years behind bars. He made numerous escape attempts, including a tunnel into the prison armory but they all failed. He eventually adapted to prison life, settled down, began to read theological books, and was put in charge of the prison Sunday school, he also studied law while behind bars, that changed attitude helped him get a pardon, and in 1894 Hardin was released from prison after he had served 17 years of his sentence. Upon his release, he took and passed Texas bar exam and became a licensed lawyer. He moved to El Paso in 1895 to start a law practice, but got into trouble when he quarreled with John Selman, a lawman who had arrested a prostitute friend of Hardin. Heated words were exchanged in that night. As Hardin was playing dice in a local saloon, Selman walked up to him from behind, shot him in the back of the head, then pumped three more bullets into him as lay on the ground. Number 4. The Deadly Psychopath Who Took On The Most Famous Lawman Of The Old West Old West Killer Frank Stilwell, born 1856, died 1882, was a psychopath who made a living as both an outlaw and as a lawman. He was once served tea instead of coffee by a cook in Arizona and shot him dead to express his displeasure. In 1879, he staked a claim and worked a mine in Mojave, Arizona, but got into an argument with another miner over claim jumping. To end the argument, Stilwell grabbed a rock and smashed in his rival's face until he was dead. He was arrested for murder, but the charges were eventually dropped for lack of evidence. In 1881, Stilwell was hired as a Cochise County Sheriff's deputy, but was fired for accounting irregularities soon thereafter. He robbed a stagecoach near Tombstone, Arizona, and was tracked down and arrested by lawman Wyatt and Virgil Earp. Stilwell produced alibi witnesses, and the charges were dropped for lack of evidence. The Earps, in their capacity as U.S. Marshals, then charged Stilwell with the federal crime of interference with a mail carrier, 
it created a perception that Stillwell was being persecuted, and led to the assassination of Wyatt's brother, Morgan Earp. Number 3. Frank Stillwell discovered that tangling with Wyatt Earp was a bad idea. Witnesses saw Frank Stillwell fleeing the scene of Morgan Earp's shooting, and Wyatt Earp formed a posse to hunt the suspects. Soon thereafter, Wyatt learned that Stillwell planned to murder his other brother, Virgil, in Tucson when the train carrying him and Morgan's coffin to California stopped there. Wyatt formed an escort to accompany Virgil, and on March 20, 1882, he spotted Stillwell and two associates waiting in ambush near Tucson's train station. Stillwell and his friends ran for their lives when they spotted Wyatt, but Stillwell stumbled. By the time Stillwell got back on his feet, Wyatt Earp was upon him, I ran straight for Stillwell, he later recounted, it was he who killed my brother, what a coward he was, he couldn't shoot when I came near him, he stood there helpless and trembling for his life, as I rushed upon him he put out his hands and clutched at my shotgun, I let go both barrels and he tumbled down dead and mangled at my feet. Number 2. The Other Old West Outlaw Who Got On Wyatt Earp's Wrong Side Old West Outlaw John Peters Ringo, born 1850 died 1882, better known as Johnny Ringo, was born in Indiana and his family moved to Missouri 1856. When Ringo was 14, the family up stakes and moved to California but en route in Wyoming. His father inadvertently killed himself when he stepped off a wagon with a loaded shotgun that accidentally discharged, the buckshot entered through the right side of his face and blew out the top of his head as it exited. Ringo S.R. was buried in Wyoming and the family continued on to California, where Johnny Ringo lived until the 1870s. He eventually moved to Mason County, Texas, and became involved in a spate of vigilante lawlessness known as the Mason County War. Next, he became associated with the Cochise County Cowboys, an outlaw group in Tombstone, Arizona, and of the corrupt Tombstone Sheriff's Office, he is best known for his hostility to and adverse run-ins with lawman Wyatt Earp and his associates, which eventually spelled Ringo's doom. Number 1. Sharing a jail cell with the deadliest outlaw of the Old West In the 1870s a young Johnny Ringo moved to Mason County, Texas, where trouble erupted between newly arrived German settlers and natural-born English-speaking Americans, it began in 1875 when a predominantly German mob dragged a pair of American cattle rustlers from a local jail and lynched them that triggered a cycle of violence in which Ringo joined the American side in a campaign of terror against the newcomers. Lowlights in the ensuing Mason County War included the murder and scalping of a German sheriff's deputy before his body was thrown down a well. Ringo was front and center in the violence and participated in multiple murders, the Texas Rangers were eventually called in to reassert law and order. By late 1876, after about a dozen men had been killed, the violence petered out and came to an end. Ringo was arrested but broke out of jail and went on the lam. He was arrested once again, and for a while shared a cell with notorious Old West killer John Wesley Hardin. The historic record is spotty about what happened next, but while Ringo's accomplices were convicted, he appears to have been acquitted.